Statistics and Excel, normal distribution, calories, data example. Got data? Let's get stuck into it with statistics and Excel. You're not required to, but if you have access to OneNote, we're in the icon, left-hand side, OneNote presentation, 1632, normal distribution, calories, example tab. We're also uploading transcripts to OneNote so that you can go to the view tab, immersive reader tool, change the language if you so choose, being able to then either read or listen to the transcript in multiple different languages, tying into the video presentation. First, a word from our sponsor. <laughs> Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product because... The fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com with the timestamps. OneNote desktop version here in prior presentations, we've been looking at how we can represent, present, demonstrate different data sets using both mathematical calculations like the mean or average, the quartiles, the median, the mode, as well as with pictorial representations like the box and whiskers, like the histogram. The histogram being the primary tool we typically envision when thinking about the spread of the data. And we can use terms to describe the spread of the data on a histogram, like it's skewed to the left, the data is skewed to the right. We then thought about lines and curves that can be represented with formulas that can approximate different data sets depending on the circumstances. If we can approximate a data set with a line or curve that has a formula related to it, that would be great because it gives us more predictive power over whatever the data set is representing. We looked at different lines, curves that uh, might have a formula related to it and could represent things in actual nature in real life, including the uniform distribution, binomial distribution, Poisson distribution, exponential distribution. Now, continuing on with one of the most famous, of course, of them all, the normal distribution or the bell curve. Remembering not all data set will conform to any of these distributions. It could be a data set that's too chaotic to conform to a simple line or curve that has an equation for it. However, we have in observed in nature that many times things do roughly conform to these patterns. And if we can find one that does, then the, the formula and the curve can be useful with the bell curve We've thought about many things in nature like heights and weights and so on uh, often conform to a bell curve type shape. So what we typically want to do is think about what we're looking at. Does the thing we're looking at conform to one of these distributions? We might test out the data to see if that is indeed the case. And then we might plot out the curve to give us more predictive power. This time we're going to be looking at calories. Now, if you're looking at calorie counts, if we were kind of tracking our calorie counts, for example, you would expect that it would follow some kind of normal distribution intuitively because you would think that my calorie count would have to be somewhere pretty steady and not be going too much on the high end or low end at any given time, given the fact that our weight has to be maintaining somewhat constant. So once we have our data, we can sort it and put a table around it, which we'll do in Excel. We could sort it by the date or we can sort it by low to high, high to low. This one currently being sorted from high to low. So what's gonna be different about this data set than some of the examples that we have had in the past are that because the calories is a pretty small unit of measure, 
then we're going to run into this issue of should we be uh, putting the calorie counts into buckets so that we can better compare our actual calorie count to what we're going to plot when we plot the calorie counts out. So this is going to be a little bit different in that way uh, to what we've seen before with the plotting of the uh, the bell curve information for the calories. So our data is on the left. We're going to start with the normal kind of stuff that we do. Does this conform to a bell curve? Well, let's do some of our normal calculations. Let's take the mean or average. This would be the formula in Excel to do so. It's at 2,189. That would be summing all of the data up and divided by the number of count. Let's take the standard deviation then. This would be the formula for Excel. So that helps us with the spread. 815. Let's take the median. That would be the one where we sort all the data. We pick the one in the middle and we're picking the 2062 because this number is fairly close to the mean. The closer it is to the mean, the more likely that it might be conforming to a bell curve. So that's an indication to us the bell curve might be useful. Here's the formula for the median and then the mode. The mode is 1776. Now this one is a little further off than than the mean but it's still fairly close so we're thinking that possibly a bell curve could still be something that would approximate this data set this would be the mode remember that the mode is the one where it's going to have the number appear multiple times and might be more or less useful depending on the type of data that we're looking at if we're looking at data such as this data which has the unit of measure is pretty small so you you might you might not have the mode where multiple mo multiple numbers show up that are exactly the same as you would if you had a smaller unit of measure that you were that you were looking at then it would be more likely that the mode would be representing that kind of middle point now the next thing we might do is plot this information into a histogram to see if it looks like a bell curve so here's a histogram of the data, just taking this data set, putting it into a histogram in Excel. Excel creating the buckets from 0 to 730, 730 to 740 calories, and so on. The middle point uh, is, is here, which would be some, the mean we recall was 2189. So it looks like it's kind of conforming to a, a bell curve. Remember that the last example that we looked at because we had a whole lot of data points, we were looking at heights, then the data looked a lot more bell-shaped. But if you don't have as many data points, then it's not gonna be as bell-shaped, but we would ex still expect that it would look like clumped in the middle and then moving out uh, towards the sides here uh, as, as the look and shape of something like a histogram, which might give us more confidence that this could be conforming to a bell curve scenario so that we can plot a bell curve. So let's plot the bell curve. We're gonna say, all right, let's take our X's, let's take our P of X's that we will then calculate. The question is, where should we start with our X's? So the X's, we're talking about calories now. So you would think you can't have zero calories because you, they'd have to be just positive calories. You cannot have negative calories. However, uh, in theory, remember that the bell curve goes in F, uh, indefinitely, infinitely, on to the left and the right. So, so let's t take our four standard deviations, remembering that if I'm trying to plot all the data so I have a pretty nice bell curve that has all the information in it so I can see the tails of the curve, four standard deviations would be the vast majority of the data. So I can do that by taking the standard deviation, 815 times four, and then I'm gonna subtract that from the middle point or mean 2189 to get to the uh, 1071. Uh, it's rounded here, so it's not exact. So let me do that again. 815 times 4 minus the 2189, about uh, 1069. Now that's a negative number. So you might say, well, why don't I just stop it at zero? Because And you could. But sometimes it's nice to to, tra to plot it all the way down in the negative so you see the whole shape of the bell uh, and it can give you another verification by the percentages adding up possibly to 100%. So we'll keep it for now just to demonstrate that. Then if I do this the other way, 815 times four standard deviations plus 
2189. We get to the high point of the 5448 on the calories. So my count then over here, if I'm going to say, all right, let's count this thing out. We're going uh, uh, negative X's and then we're going to go all the way down to the positive. Now I've cut some of it out here. We'll have the whole thing in Excel, but I'm just going to, then it goes into the positive. Here's the positive calories and so on. Then we can do our P of X calculation. This would be the norm dot dist. Oh, actually notice that this X here, uh, we did this with a formula that we'll demonstrate in Excel as well, because what we want to do is go from negative 1069 up to positive 5448. Now you could do that by putting negative 1069, negative 1068, highlighting those two and having Excel see the sequence as you go down, but you'd have to go down 5,488 times. So it might be faster to use the formula of sequence. And what we want is the sum of those two plus one in terms of how many columns do we want? We want, or rows, not columns, 5448 plus 1069. We want 6517 uh, columns here. So that would be uh, 6517 plus one columns. And then skipping the start, that's why we have two commas. And then the starting point is going to be that 1069. Then it'll plot all of these X's for us without us having to kind of drag it down. Once we have that, we can then do our norm.dist. Now it looks funny because calories are negative up top, but remember we kept the negatives uh, for, the, for the examples of the curve of a normal distribution so that we can get the full four standard deviations on the low side. Norm.dist, we're taking the mean and the standard deviation, which of course would be this number and this number in our function or formula. And then we've got, does it, should it be cumulative? It's going to be not cumulative or zero. So then if we do this all the way down, you can see that it's plotting these out. Now, if I get into the positive numbers down here, so now we've got the, the likelihood of our data set being at 126 calories is 0 0.0020. So note, when we're looking at this, we're getting pretty small numbers in part due to the fact that that our calories are a pretty small unit of measurement. So, so that means if I'm looking at just this one calorie point of 166, then the percent is pretty low. It's likely that we're going to be asking questions about ranges, like what's the likelihood of being 167 or below or something like that, which you would be tempted to sum it all up but you'd have to use another formula because we're talking about area under the curve. Although, because this is much more detailed because we're using a pretty fine detailed approach here, you get a pretty good approximation <laughs> if you were just to sum, sum up the whole thing. We'll talk more about that later though. So now we, we wanna be, so here's where an issue comes up. We wanna be able to compare this to the actual count. Now, the ways we've done that in the past is we said, okay, well, I can take my actual count. I can count all of the all of the numbers over here using a count formula of this. How many how many data points do we have with a count function? And it comes out to 457. So we have 457, far less data points than the last example we had where we had like 4,000 data points. So I could say I'm going to take this number times the 457 but you're going to get you're going to get these really small fractions of the number because we have such small units of uh, measurement here. Or last time, what we did is we we grouped all of our all of our actual data over here into bins or buckets based on the calorie counts. But that's still not going to work quite as well this time because because there's there's such fine data over here that we're just going to have a bunch of zero 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 and then every once in a while we'll have one that landed into a bucket and then a bunch of zeros because again we have so many uh small units of of the calorie count so for example here is us taking the percent uh times uh times the count so remember that the count was what was the count uh 457 
So if I go down here, even to one of the larger percents, it's still a quite a small number. If I take that uh, 457, I think it was, times, and I'll multiply it times this one, which is 0. 0.00021, if I put it in decimal format, then you get this really small number. And this small number is, isn't going to match any actual data count because, of course, the data count is just going to be a one. You can't have less than one of the data. So when I match that up over to my actual frequency, so this is the actual frequency, meaning we're looking at these in terms of buckets, and this would be counting how many times in our actual data set we had a count that was above 126, but below uh, and including 127. And you get a bunch of zero, 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 zero for all of them. And then every once in a while, you're gonna have a one uh, over here uh, in our frequency. So it's gonna be difficult to compare those out. Last time when, 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 this, uh, when we had different examples in the past, when we were talking about heights, uh, for example, or weight, then we then this frequency count kind of lined up fairly nicely because we didn't have such small units of measurement and we were able to then take the percent of the total and give a comparison of the percent of the total and the p of x over here which we're not as able to do in this data set the nice thing on this side of being able to take each calorie count in excel even though it's quite a long set of data is that when you add this up it adds up to basically pretty close to 100%, which is kind of a nice double check. So what we would like to do, though, is we'd like to say, okay, well, I'd like to kind of group this stuff together so that these P of X's would be for the range of like anything less than a, a zero. And then everything from zero to 400, for example, I would like to kind of sum that up into a group. And then when I do my frequency count for my actual counts, we can put them into bins or buckets. There's a couple different ways we can do that when we're looking at our actual data that we could just use this to kind of sum up into our buckets, sum these up. And uh, remember that normally we, we don't like to do that here because we're talking about the area under the curve, but because we're using such fine data, we get to a pretty close number or we can use a formula, which will be the between formula so that we can, we can use the norm.dist from the upper range minus the lower range. So let me show you what I mean. We'll do a couple of these over here. We're going to say that we have the X's and the X's are going to go up by 400. So these are going to be basically our buckets. So we got it going from zero up to 400 and then 400 to 800 four, and then 800 to 1200 so that we have our buckets instead of just one calorie at a time. So then the actual frequency, if I was to do my frequency calculation then, now I can do my frequency and have buckets that are much larger. So for example, this one would be saying everything that's greater than zero up to and including 400 in our actual count over here of our actual data. And we had five of those. This one would be saying everything over 400 up to and including 800 of the actual count. We got 14 of those. We're doing this with the frequency calculation, the data array being our table on the left, and then the bins being these bins. And it gives us our buckets, which is nice. So now we have actual numbers in here, as opposed to if we did it one calorie at a time, when we did our frequency we had almost zero numbers with one, like a one showing up every once in a while. Uh, although I don't have a lot of the data in here because I didn't want to copy it all over, but we do this in Excel if you want to check it out. The sum adds up to 157, which is a double check that these bins are adding up because that's what our actual count was of our actual uh, number of data. Now we can take the percentage of total and it gives us something that may actually be relevant, meaning I could say, okay, this is going to be five divided by the total divided by the 457, and that gives us uh, 1.09. Uh, and this is the same thing, 14 divided by the total, 14 divided by four, 457 is 3.06 if I move the decimal two places over. So now the question is, well, if I, can, if I can do the same thing for my P of X information, then I have something that's kind of comparable. 
And we're going to do that with a formula that looks something like this, and then we'll do it another way as well. This is a sum if formula, and it's saying sum if, and we're picking up uh, the sum range, which in this case, we're looking at the P of X's over here. So we want the P of X's, comma, uh, the criteria. So we want, we're going to pick up uh, the criteria range, which is going to be this information. And, and then we're picking up the uh, criteria, it's got to be less than or equal to uh, this number over here, it's got to be less than or equal to, in this case, the zero. So that's so I'm summing that up. So so it's basically saying, pick this up. If the x is less than zero, sum this up. So it's summing everything up down to when the x is zero. And then this one is summing everything up. If I did a similar formula, it would look a little bit different. But this one would be summing everything up. If x is greater than zero up to and including 400, and we would be picking up this column if this area, the X was between zero and 400. Now, remember, usually that's just an approximation, but because we have such fine units, we come up with a pretty close approximation. So that's one method that we can use. And now we have comparable numbers. I'm like, okay, there's 800 actual data came out to 14.06 versus the 3% that if we use this technique of summing it up, and I can see if this adds up to 100, it adds up pretty close to 100% on this data, which might give another indication that that's given me a pretty accurate calculation. And then I can take a, I can also do it this way. I can take my uh, P of X uh, count times the count, meaning now that I have these numbers, I can multiply them times the number of counts that we had. So I can take this number of 0 0.036, 0 0.0036, 0 0.0036 times the count of 457 and then we get around two and now i can compare this two to this five so so these are the two ways that we can kind of compare our data sets right i can convert i can convert the norm.dist to to a count by multiplying it times the count and comparing it to our actual frequency count or i can convert our actual frequency count to a percent to compare that to the percents, the only difference here now being that we put these items into buckets so that we're not talking about one calorie at a time. Uh, the other way you can do this buckets thing, which is which is more accurate, uh, uh, would be to say I'm going to have a lower buck, a lower bin, and an upper bin from zero uh, up by 400, 400 to 800, 800 to 1,200, and so on and so forth, and then use our norm dot dist. Uh, uh, formula uh, to calculate it. This one's calculating the first one, which is just norm dot dist to for the four for the zero. But for the second one, you'd have to have norm dot dist of the upper part minus the norm dot dist for the lower part. So it would look like this. You'd have norm dot dist of the x of the higher x, and then the mean, the standard deviation. It needs to be cumulative. That's the one minus the norm dot dist for the lower part, the zero, if you're talking about the second one, and that'll give you that in between. This should be more accurate than what we did up top summing, but because we we did such a fine, uh, we have such a fine unit of measure, they're pretty close either way that you do it. So we get the 0.36, the 1.04, the three, the, the 6.82, the 0.36, the 1.04, the three, the 6.82. So they're pretty close. Either way, this one comes out. You can see if I add them up to exactly 100%, this one came up to 99.99. Okay, let's go on to our graphs then. So once we have this, then we can kind of graph them together. We can put both of these on the same graph. This is graphing, I believe, the uh, actual percent column and the P of X column. So we're looking at our actual data and the 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 function data on one graph and you can see they line up fairly close giving us further indication that a bell curve might be an appropriate tool to use to approximate this data uh this one this one is i a uh, a i believe this is a, a bar graph of this data over here 
probably should have labeled it better. <laughs> this data over here, where we picked up all of this, right? Now, this, this was a long column because remember, if we did it one calorie at a time, that we had a whole lot of, we had 106,517, you know, calories in total. So if I graph that even with a line graph, then you get something that looks almost like a smooth curve, right? It doesn't look like this jagged thing over here, or it doesn't look like this, this jagged, uh, this jagged thing here, because we have such fine data that we're using, uh, not this isn't the actual data. This is the curve that we're plotting, but we're plotting it on a calorie by calorie basis. And that's one of the reasons, again, that if you, uh, when you when you think about the area under the curve and and you think about the integral calculus of it if because you have such the fine so fine of the lines could be the reason why that if we sum up you know we sum everything up this way that that we come up to something very close to uh if we did it with a calculation of uh the the norm dot dist so there is that one